Okay, we are live now. So welcome everyone. So welcome to this series of Latin American webinars on physics. Today we have a super interesting uh, seminar. We have a very special one because it's not about higher level physics or astroparticles, astrophysics, but we have very special webinar. As I told you, it will be about the modeling COVID-19 on the fly by Professor Roberto Krankel. Huh? Did I pronounce it well? So Roberto is from University, from Institute of Federal Physics in São Paulo, Universidad Estadual Paulista in Brazil. And so thank you very much, Roberto, for being here with us and sharing all your expertise. So, yeah. Please, so uh, thank you for this kind invitation. Thank you uh, for watching me, actually. And uh, so I, I know the community of the, which usually attend the seminars are very high, high energy and astroparticle astro physics. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, but this will be a low energy down to earth seminar. Okay? So uh, ju just to make the, I mean, just to introduce myself, it's uh, I, I, I work on what people usually call complex systems or whatever. Uh, Nonlinear uh, 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 dynamics with multiple uh, agents and so on and so on and so on. And I work with applications in biological systems and mainly in epidemiology and ecology. So uh, that, that's the thing I do. I'm at, uh, at over the last uh, over the last ten or fifteen years. Before that, I I used to be a more theoretical guy. Uh, now I'm more applied theory. So, very good. So, uh, I will share my screen so that you see my presentation. Uh, let me see. Uh, there's always a share screen. Okay, screen shared. And here we go. So this uh, this uh, this seminar will be about uh, modeling uh, coronavirus epidemic uh, epidemics uh, COVID nineteen on the fly on the fly means just uh, as it is happening okay and this is very different from doing theoretical uh, work it, it is something completely crazy so uh, so. The main thing, let, let, let's, let's see how all of this uh, works. So say you are at the, at the beginning of an epidemic and this is an epidemic, it is a new emergent disease. What, what does it mean? It's, it's a disease that no one is immune. Everybody is susceptible of of of, uh, uh, of of getting uh, 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 this disease in, in the case COVID nineteen, but anyway, this would this would be uh, the same for any any emergent disease. So that that's in the the, the jargon in epidemiology as that a new emergent disease. Okay? So uh, and every epidemic of a new disease starts with an exponential growth. So that means that you have a completely uh, a susceptible population. Everybody is, is let's say, uh, able <laughs> uh, to, to catch the disease. I mean, uh, to, be, to be infected. And uh, there is a certain uh, number of secondary cases given a, a primary cases. And this number at the, at the beginning of the epidemics is usually constant okay so at at the very beginning of an epidemic you you could you could say okay i, I want to model epidemics and i, I will talk about that in the, in, in the second part but uh, so you will want to write down for instance equations or models that will explain you all the epidemic curve the epidemic curve is the number of people that are, are infected over the time like this one Okay, so nice. You would like to explain all the epidemic curve, but when you are at the very at the very beginning of the epidemic, you just don't see the epidemic curve. You just see some cases, right? 
And this is well approximated by, uh, by an exponential. Okay? So no need of, of big models at this point. It's very simple, just an exponential. Uh, so uh, what can we do with that? Okay? So if you, if you try to take a big model and, and just fit the model with the first points of your epidemic, you will get an enormous amount of uncertainty. There's no point of doing that at this point, at, at this point of time. So, the, there, so the, the, the thing is, uh, at, at the very beginning, uh, what are the problems that a modeler uh, would face? The uh, first thing is that uh, uh, the data is very noisy. And noisy means you don't know, for instance, the date of the first case. You would say, well, but okay, I go to the newspaper and they say that the first case was they, I don't know, 20 something of February. In Brazil, it was 25 of February, I think. So. so that's the first case. But is it the relevant case? Because if the first, the first cases are all of them important, uh, somebody coming from abroad bringing the disease. If this person didn't multiply, didn't transmit, it is the first case, but it's it's irrelevant for the epidemic, actually. So the first uncertainty you have is you don't know the uh, first case. Uh, when when did your epidemic start? Unknown exact date, more or less. You know it, but so you don't know when the epidemic actually started, because uh, uh, because of this uh, this phenomenon of uh, when really. The replication of case at the start. Okay, so at the at the first moment, what you try to do is just to just to to characterize what is happening. So, and you can do this by calculating two uh, uh, two numbers. Well, one is the, the doubling time, which means uh, how long does it take to double the number of cases? So, uh, if you have an exponential growth, the doubling time is constant. I mean, constant over time. Okay. It's just a geometric series. And uh, so you could try to calculate that and, and give a characterization of, of, the, of this part, this, this, this initial part of, of the... And then uh, another uh, uh, interesting number is the effective reproductive number. It's, it's the number of secondary cases given a primary case, uh, which you can calculate from the doubling time plus some other characteristics which I uh, of the disease, which uh, well, I, I won't go into the details. Anyhow. So these are the first things that you can do, and uh, so that's what you do. You go on, and uh, doubling time is easy to calculate. You just put it on an exponential uh, a year, excuse me, on a logarithmic uh, a plot. You get a you got a line, and you discover that oops. And you discover that the, the epidemic, uh, the number of cases more or less doubles every two and a half or two, three days. That's everywhere, more or less everywhere in the world, except for very special cases like Korea or Taiwan. And uh, so that, that's the easy part. You see that obviously it. Uh, you, the points don't line exactly on a, uh, don't lie exactly on a line. You have to do some fitting. You can do this. You'd say uh, 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 least squares or, or whatever. You can do that better. There are people from statistics that will do this in a very sophisticated way. With supposing that you have a Poisson process behind of this and so on. You can do this in many ways. And, and, and you can fit the best line and you can get the even error bars and uh, whatever. And uh, then uh, you can also say, okay, we are at the beginning of the epidemic. And uh, the number of people that are uh, infected is uh, very, very small uh, uh, compared to the total population. So um, we are still in the, we will be for some time at least in the, in the, 
in the exponential phase. So I can extend this into the future and I can make projections, okay? Which will be valid for say a week or 10 days or something like that. So you can do this and uh, uh, you, you, you actually do it. So, uh, so the doubling time uh, is, is important when you have, are at the very beginning of the epidemic, it's characterized the epidemic. So for COVID, it's two and a half days or three days, more or less. There are lots of uncertainties, but more or less it's like that. So this is the, the doubling time at the beginning of the epidemic. And this has been true for, uh, for Europe, US, Brazil, and so on, and Argentina, and, and, and whatever. So that's more or less characteristic of the COVID-19. And you can also calculate uh, the reproductive number, which is uh, the number of uh, secondary infect uh, infections created by a primary infector. And uh, in Brazil, this is a line between two and three, and uh, more or less everywhere in the world, and in, in, in China, it's like 2.7 or something. So this is, uh, this is um, uh, the characterization of the, of the epidemic at the very first stage. So a way of keeping track of the epidemic at the beginning of the epidemic would be just calculating the doubling time like uh, locally. Okay, I go, I have today, and I use the last, let's say it's five days or seven days, and I calculate the doubling time. Right? So I go on in there. And, and uh, so if I am a really exponential phase, this doubling time doesn't depend uh, on time, it's constant. But well, there are many, uh, in, in most countries, there are uh, isolation uh, 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 measures. Uh, people are uh, staying at home and so on. So you expect that the doubling time increases, means that the epidemic is going slower and slower. Right? So, so you can do this and you can follow the, uh, the doubling time over, over the time. Right? So here you have a, a, an example of what this means. This has been made uh, like a month ago, okay? Which was uh, uh, March 18th, okay? Brazil was only these two points at that, at that time. And, uh, but, but you see that there, there are countries that are clearly doing something, which is Korea in this case, which means that the doubling time started somewhere like two or three okay, here, and it uh, increased and it's, uh, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, I don't know here, it, it's a logarithmic thing, but uh, 30, uh, 30 days or something, so it's very slow evolution of this case. So that, that's, that's good, right? On the, on the other hand, you have this counter here, which is Thailand, which is doing very bad, okay? So the doubling time is decreasing, means that the, the, the pace of the, in, of the epidemic is, uh, is, is uh, speeding up, okay? So that's a way to compare things. Uh, you usually put today and then you look uh, for some days uh, ago and, and, and look how this behaves. So you expect that if uh, once you introduce uh, um, policies like uh, social distancing or uh, contact tracing or whatever things that you do to, uh, to, to have uh, uh, the epidemic slowing down, you expect to see at this on a plot like that uh, uh, with a doubling time that's increasing, okay? This would be a very effective way of keeping track. I'm not talking about modeling at this point, yeah? I'm just talking about how, how to keep, keep track of what is happening, okay? So this is happening, you, you, you look at that, okay? So what could be go wrong, okay, with this? It seems perfect, okay, it's, it's trivial. Oh, that there are so many things that can go wrong. And that's when you, when you, as a theoretical physics, you, you, at a certain point, you want to give up. You say, you know, I, I can cope, I can cope with that kind of thing. And what kind of thing is. So 
you don't know the number of cases. And so at the very beginning, you have a certain number of cases being notified every day. Every day there's something that it's, it's in the website of your country saying that the number of cases is X, right? That's it. You go on, you do your doubling time analysis and you keep on tracking and everything and you say, okay, yeah, 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 everything's nice. So, but what happens is that uh, when the number of cases uh, increases, you hit barriers and the main barriers. So, uh, so one barrier is what people call sub-notification. Sub-notification means not notifying, not keeping track of cases uh, that are potentially positive. So uh, in Brazil, this means uh, from um, um, March 20th, Brazil is only testing people that are in severe cases. So mild cases are not even tested. So these people don't leave a trace on the statistics, nothing, anything. There's nothing there. So this is sub, sub notification. So you, are, you only have the severe cases, but okay. Then you say, okay, I have the severe cases. Let, let me follow the severe cases. Let me keep track of the severe cases. So in, in order to do that, you know, you have to know how many severe cases you have, but then you, you hit a barrier, which is a hard barrier that you have a limited testing capability which means that you have a, num a limited number of tests that you can perform per day. So, uh, which, which means what? Aren't there sufficient uh, uh, testing uh, uh, tests? Well, sometimes you have the test, but you don't have the people to perform the test. And then uh, after the people, you, you, need, you need machines and you all need other things in the labs and so on. So, there's a maximum uh, uh, ability to, to perform tests. Okay? You cannot perform more than a certain point. So at the very beginning, this is not a problem because you have a constant flux of people, of tests going, going into the, your system. Your system is not overflown and you, you get a constant output. But now you have a certain bottleneck here and a lot of people, a lot of tests coming here and through your bottleneck, you have only a constant number of outputs here. That's a problem. That's a real problem. So you don't know how many people are, are sick. Okay. So your doubling time. What what does it mean? You don't know anymore what it is. And then still, once you say, okay, I have now I I I I, I hired more people, I, I I bought more tests and then everything. And uh, uh, there still is a lag between the, the results of the tests and typing them, them into the database, okay? So th this is really down, down to real world things and, and you have to cope with that if you want to do something relevant for, the, for informing people that take decisions about it, okay? So, and all these legs between, for instance, the legs between having the result and typing them into the system are not constant. Maybe just on Sunday, people don't work. So they don't have it, anything on, on Sunday. So it may be a better take a moving average or whatever. So you need a lot of statistical uh, machinery to uh, cope with this kind of uh, problem, okay? So, most importantly is if a lab can only test a certain fixed number of cases, it means that the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 or whatever you're talking about, but say COVID-19, the number of confirmed cases will not increase exponentially, it will increase linearly. If I can only put out say a hundred tests per day, 
and uh, I have a proportion of a certain number, say 80% is, is positive COVID, I will get 80, 80 positive tests of COVID-19 per day, which is linear increase. However, the epidemic is actually probably increasing still exponentially. So there's no relation between confirmed cases and actual, uh, actual number of cases because you have a bottleneck with your, with your testing uh, apparatus. So that's, that's really, really, really the end of the world. Okay? So you, you, you cannot, the, the, the thing uh, uh, which seems so, so nice that's keeping track of the state of the epidemic, if, if our measures of our isolation policies are, are doing okay or not, just keeping track of the doubling time doesn't work like that. And, and I know that this is really problematic because we have a site, we have a, we have a website. I, well, when I say we, there's a, it's a bunch of people that work together. And, uh, uh, and we had this doubling times and, and uh, at the very beginning and we are looking at that and uh, uh, lots of journalists or whatever asking us uh, how is the thing going and so on. And at a certain point, we saw an, an enormous increase in the doubling time as if the epidemics were just going, well, I mean, uh, if, uh, if the effects of the isolation measures were super, super, super strong. Well, you just look at that, that and say, well, uh, it, it's not true. It's, it's just because we are not testing enough. So the bottleneck of having the number of tests is very important and, and spoils your analysis. So very big problem. Okay. So what can you do in this case? Okay. So it depends, depends. The first thing is what data you have access. So if you have access to only to the data that is usually made public by most of the government, Governments, which is the number of confirmed cases per day, you cannot do much. But just just a minute. But sometimes you can be lucky enough, or you can be smart enough to get access to more detailed data. So if you get access to more detailed data, not only the number of confirmed cases, you can try to do the now casting of cases. So now casting of cases is the following. I, ha I need to have the access to a full uh, uh, data of, of cases, which are suspected cases. And uh, I know uh, when is the date of the first symptom. I know the day the test has been performed how long does it take to have the result of the test? How long does it take to have the test on the database and so on? So if I have a statistics of that, I can use the present situation and using the knowledge that there are a certain number of people that are, are that a number of tests that are being performed and so on, I can project from this from the past to the present and estimate the number of cases I have right now, okay? So to do this, you need more specific data as the public data means that you have to work with authorities. And this is very difficult. This is, uh, well, it depends on the country and depends on your position and whatever. So in Brazil, on my group and uh, people that have been working with me, we have uh, access only to the municipality of Sao Paulo, not the state of Sao Paulo, not, not to speak of Brazil, the country, but we have access to data of the municipality of Sao Paulo. So you have a spreadsheet where, where you have each line is a case and has the, 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 this data has been uh, is anonymous. They, they just took out the name and, and uh, the, the identification of the person. 
but it has all the dates of all occurrences, like uh, um, first symptoms, uh, they, he, the person went to the doctor, they, the person went, got tested, and so on, so on, so on. And so you can do some, some now casting of data. So now the casting of data means this. You see, that, that's uh, what's well, in Portuguese, but I think you, you will understand it. So that's the observed number of cases here, which is actually looking like it's, it's leveling. It's, it's, it's not very increasing very much. But here you have the now casting of the day. How many cases we have right now? Then well, with some simple model, you can, here in the case, we have a logistic model, but you can have all this financial model and so on. So that, that, that's, uh, that's not the worst case scenario. It's, 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 it, it's a relatively mild scenario, which is uh, adjusting a logistic curve here, uh, uh, which is an S-shaped curve, and uh, to the observed data. Okay? So you can do some projection for some days here. Okay? And uh, you could do it with other models instead of the logistic. You could have uh, some exponential model, and it would give you the worst case scenario. And so, on. so, so doing now casting allows you to have a better uh, view of what is actually happening, and uh, uh, you are not being, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, dumped. You are you are not being. Uh, fooled by by the fact that the, the number of observed cases is, is like becoming constant. It's becoming constant because you don't have the number necessary number of tests. But uh, well, uh, knowing what what is coming on uh, in in the in, in line for your test, maybe you can get a better estimate of what is happening right now. So you see there are error bars. All of this is a lot of statistics. It's Bayesian statistics, uh, and so on. And a lot of the Things, uh, behind that. So now casting of days is, is the way to keep track of what is happening right now. So just to know the situation, right? We are not, we are not talking about models at this point. Okay. So next, okay, looking ahead. Now you say, okay, you have the now casting and you have an idea of how, how many cases you have. So what will happen next? So uh, so models in epidemiology are all of them based, or, I mean, all of them, maybe 90% of them, are based on dividing the population into classes, susceptible individuals, infected individuals, recovered individuals, exposed individuals, hospitalized people, uh, infected but not infectious, infectious but not uh, symptomatic, whatever you want, lots of possibilities. So, and you have fluxes between these classes, okay? um, which will be con connected to contact rates between the classes. So, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm not writing down the equation for that, and uh, it's, it's, it's no point here to, to analyze the equations, but uh, so. You divide the populations, and so what kind of models do people in, in, in epidemiology work with? So what I, I like um, I like most is, is differential equations, is the, the, it's deterministic equations for the number of people in the, each class, susceptible, infected, recovered, or whatever other classes you have in your model. Uh, so this is uh, it's, it's, it's a nice way to do the things. Then uh, you could also do stochastic dynamics. Uh, suppose you have a Markov processes and you go on and, 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 and you have like, like, a, like, like reactions, okay? And uh, you do, do stochastic dynamics and you could also do um, individual based modeling. Individual based modeling means that you have a, uh, individuals that can be in any of these classes and then they do something, they may move around, they, they may interact or whatever, depends on the model. And then you see how the, the, the epidem epidemic spreads in the population. Okay? So 
Uh, what we are working on right now is, is a, it's, it's the it's a Brazilian version of the, what it's called Como model. Como is consortium of modelers, uh, which is based at the, in, at the University of Oxford, and uh, uh, which has all these classes. Okay? I, 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 I don't want you to, and I mean, I don't expect you to, to now to, to look at all the classes you have infected, uh, with no symptoms, with mild symptoms, hospitalized, and then lots of things can happen if you are need hospitalization. Maybe you find a bed for you, but uh, maybe you don't find. Maybe you need an uh, ICU, but the, you have an ICU or don't you have an ICU and so on. And, and there are probabilities of all uh, from going from one, from one class to the other classes, or if you want rates or probabilities, if you want. Uh, and then you get, uh, in, uh, at a certain point, you get uninfected or, or dead. Uh, and uh, most people now take take for granted that the in most most models take it that immunity is uh, is 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 there. I mean, you are immune after having the symptom. Okay? So this is a big model, and this generates this kind of kind of uh, a plot. So uh, don't, don't pay too much attention on, on, on the numbers because this is a preliminary result. This has been done, doing, I mean, they, they, this is the result of two days ago. So it's not still something at, at the level of, of being published and so on. But the important thing about models is, and this is very, very different, different from what you have usually in, 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 Oops. What you have usually in with with, uh, with systems and physics, the models are not made to make really precise predictions. Because why? Why? Because uncertainties are are enormous. As I told you, you don't know even your initial condition, which is the number of infected people. You don't. Know not it. You have to estimate this, and you have enormous error bars. And you know these error bars go on multiplying and so on. And it, 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 it's it's a hell, and there are a lot of parameters and so on. So what do you do with the models? So what what you do with the models is to build scenarios. And what's a scenario? You have a baseline scenario, which means that you don't do anything. Just let the epidemic go on. Epidemic go. On. What will happen? Like in Brazil, it would be like almost two million of, of, of people dead. Yeah? But then you know that even the most crazy government in the world will not do anything. By, by, even, I mean, even, even, uh, even crazy people. It would do something, okay? So there are interventions. Then you can model the interventions in your model and see how effective they will be. So say intervention, just making people wash their hands a lot of time. This has a very small effect, but you can try to quantify this into a model. Then you say, okay, isolation. Okay, voluntary isolation or or mandatory isolation. Then you say quarantine or lockdown, full lockdown. So you can trace scenarios and, and, and try to see what will happen according to the assumptions you made and for how long you do this and this and so on and so on. So I don't have results for Brazil at this point. We are working on that actually. I think we are one of the only groups that is working on that in, in Brazil. These, these results are not uh, final, but uh, there are results for, for other groups uh, in, in the world. And uh, uh, this is a paper from yesterday. So yeah, just to, 
to have an idea how this thing is is evolving a, a month ago is eternity. So uh, this is a paper from from a Harvard group from Mark Lipsic, which is one of the leading epidemiologists in the world. So uh, and he was he was looking at scenarios uh, not for the new future like like one month or two, but uh, what what will be the issue of this all of this? Certo. Um, so uh, there are two main factors which are completely unknown to us in order to make more long-time scenarios. If one factor is, is this, this disease seasonal or not? No idea. Is it depending on temperature? We don't know. If you look at uh, the archives, there's a specific archive for this kind of thing, which is not an archive, it's called Med Archive. And there's a section of epidemiology, which is, uh, has a lot of paper, uh, more than 10 papers per day uh, on COVID. And uh, there are papers saying, yeah, temperature has effect. And other papers saying temperature has no effect. So we don't know the seasonal behavior of, of, the, of the epidemic, of this disease. And the second thing, we don't know anything about immunity. Is immunity going to be long-term? So we know something about immunity, which means that if, if you had COVID now, you, you don't have it next, next day. But uh, how long will this last? Can I have uh, uh, lifetime uh, immunity, lifelong immunity? Lifelong immunity would be nice, okay? But um, maybe you have veining Im immunity, immunity over some, some, on some time. So important, impossible to know, okay? Uh, so you have to build up scenarios and, and, and try to figure out what is happening and then as the epidemic progresses, we will get more and more results, but maybe we'll select which scenario you are. So here, just as an example, uh, this paper has appeared yesterday in Science. And uh, so th this is a long-term uh, uh, thing, you see, until the year 2025, uh, four year, five years, uh, another thing. And, uh, what happens is, uh, so this is, Taking into account, you have seasonality. So you have, and uh, so this is with US data, and it's usually assumed for temperate climate. So you have a strong seasonality, and, and in the winter you have more infectious than infections than than in the summer, which may, may not be the case in many of our countries in Latin America. So this has to be adapted. But what, what you see is uh, here are several uh, uh, integrate. Uh, so th there, there's a big model, differential equation model. Okay? Uh, and, and you see that if you have uh, uh, immunity for 40 weeks, which is a very short time immunity, right? it's not even one year, you will have recurrent epidemic, just like flu. Okay. which is really a problem, a real problem. Okay. If you have longer time uh, epidemic, for instance, if you have a, a 104 weeks uh, immunity, you ha will have bi biannual outbreaks every two years. And obviously, if you have complete immunity, sometimes at a certain point, the, the thing will, will go away. Okay? And th th this scenario here is from something intermediate, where you have small outbreaks all the time. So with seasonality and finite duration of immunity, you can have several scenarios but the main thing is uh, you expect this to come back unless you have lifetime immunity. So bad news. 
uh, obviously, if there's a vaccine, then everything changes. And we hope to have a vaccine, actually, because uh, there's no reason that we you should be very pessimistic for a vaccine. But in, in the absence of a vaccine, you see the immune, uh, having partial immunity and not lifelong immunity will bring back the epidemic. Another thing that these same people have uh, studied is, okay, uh, let's see there's no seasonality, just to make the things uh, easier, and let's do one-time interventions. So this is not a long-time scenario, it's an uh, intermediate-time scenario. What happens if we only have one-time interventions, which is, is the temptations of many of, uh, of governments and in, 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 in it, well, in Latin America, and uh, not only there. So you say, okay, enough with the, enough with interventions. Uh, uh, everything should be okay. So what what you see here in, in blue is the time of interventions. You have uh, and uh, and the many curves you see uh, is is the fact of intervention. So no intervention, and uh, how effective the interventions are. Okay. So you see that the only optimistic case is to maintain an intervention for all time. It's obviously not possible. In this case, if the intervention is strong enough, you have a curve here with a very small mortality. The, these are mortality curves here. So uh, you see the secondary peaks here in these cases. Yeah. Yeah, in all cases, you have secondary uh, wave, okay? And one-time interventions are really not enough to do the job, okay? So what are our best, I mean, best hopes? It's, it's vaccination, which can happen. And well, and uh, uh, something is, which is not shown here in this uh, in this uh, thing is to have long time testing and isolation, which would, would be more or less correspondent to this case here. Okay, so the interventions doesn't mean necessarily that you are at home all the time for the rest of your life. Interventions can be very effective, also if. People are tested intensively, test everybody like that, and, and isolate people that uh, the tests the test the positive, and everybody that has been in contact with these people over the last week. For instance, this would generate a curve of low mortality, like the one that we see here. Okay? So uh, this this result from the Harvard group is is uh, means that. Uh, just uh, short time interventions will generate second second waves and uh, and that's it. You need long time interventions, and uh, and uh, this can be of several kinds. Okay, I, I'm I'm not saying you need to stay at home forever, but uh, you need to have some way of having having interventions over the time. And the one way of having interventions is to have uh, testing a, a large majority of the population. Uh, and, and isolate people that test, uh, test uh, positive. Okay. So that's it. Uh, uh, and uh, just to, so there are a lot of people that have been working on several aspects. So you, you see the number of names here is impossible to, 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 to read. There are people from physics, from biology, from computation and uh, from medicine and working. And we have, we have an initiative, it's called the uh, COVID-19 Brazil Observatory. And uh, uh, so these people are doing a lot of things, which I mean, I didn't mention everything that people are doing. And uh, so that's it. And uh, so thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Roberto, for the super nice talk. Uh, are there problems, uh, sorry, are there questions? Uh, yeah, the, the virus is a problem at the moment. <laughs> uh, I, I do have Pro one question. Problems, there are yes. a lot of problems. Yeah, <laughs> problems we do have, Nicolas. Um, thank you for your webinar. Um, I, 
I have a question that maybe you can comment uh, without going into many technicalities, but I was wondering like how should we read those error bars like more or less like uh, for me that I'm not an expert on modeling or something uh, what what type of things are keeping into account whenever you have these error bars when you present something two, two things two mm. things two main things first your parameters are not precise okay you have a model has parameters effectivity time to time of uh, recovery and so on. All of this is, is, is our probability distributions, not, not, not really constant. So this generates the four error bars, probability distributions. And second, and more difficult than just, uh, just uh, looking for the sensitivity to your parameters, is the fact that you don't know your state. Your initial state is unknown. Okay. And uh, that, that's a problem. That's a problem. You don't know your initial state. So if you, if you go for, a problem, for things with differential equations or even other, other, other kind of models. Also. So you have, you have two sources. Uh, one, are you don't know the parameters. Second, you don't know the initial state. I mean, it's not that you don't know every, anything about the initial state. You know, but you, you have a probability distribution for your initial state also. So uh, you have, you have this two sources are, are of, of errors are, I see. Uh, they are a problem and, and, and that's why, it, it, so this is a little bit like meteorology, okay? You want yeah. to, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, yeah, that, it's not a chaotic system, but oh, it, it's a, a system with, with time dependent coefficients and uh, with time dependency being whatever you want. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the problem is, at a certain point, you make prediction with error bars that says that you could have, a, say, a thousand or a million of people infected, so, which means nothing, nothing. This is not informative for any, any people, any person in, at, at, at the government or trying to take a decision. And uh, the person wants to know, will I have a lot of people dead or not? If I say you have 10 people dead, they say, okay, it's, it's normal. You say I have a million people dead. It's, it's very important for this person. And uh, uh, if your model just says between 10 and 1 million, it, the model says nothing. I see. Thank you. Any I do have questions? more questions. <laughs> I actually have one. If you, Robert, if you please could go back to your slide. Uh, okay. To the slide yeah, when you were I'm talking about sure. technology. Share screen. Okay. Go back where? Maybe two slides back. I think slide uh, uh, twelve. I don't know the number of the. the... That, that that one. So yeah. in your first scenario, the the one corresponding to forty weeks, there is a case where the number of cases increases with time. I mean, it's like a. Uh, black or red curve yes there there are uh, there are cases that can increase again because there's a replenishment of susceptibles due to the birth of people people who get that are given birth are susceptible okay that's like a the, the worst case scenario right <laughs> this is the scenario yeah that, that, that's uh, I don't think, I mean, this, this is a little bit a frightening scenario in the sense that uh, this is pretty much like, like, like influenza, like, like flu, okay? A flu, it's, it's not that, it's different in the sense that you, you don't have long time uh, immunity because, because the, 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 the virus uh, uh, has a, such a high, high uh, um, uh, mutation rate that you, everybody actually does not have immunity for more than one year. So then you get this kind of scenario here. Okay. So this would be the flu scenario like uh, thing for, for COVID, but you know, COVID is 20 or 30 times more deadly than, than flu, which would be a disaster. But I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the only scenario. I mean, uh, this is one possible scenario, but not necessarily the one that will happen and uh, we but but we are really in the dark about hum immunity nobody knows because we have this 
epidemic for three months. Yet. So people don't know if the people will continue to be immune or not. So no idea, no idea at all. Okay, thanks. So there's a question from the public, actually from Diego Restrepo. So he's asking in practice, how well your models have been predicting the evolution of the epidemic in Brazil? So we, uh, that, that, that's a point that we, we have not uh, completed the work. That, that's why I didn't show you the, the full thing, okay? Uh, the, the, this kind of model. Uh, uh, I, I didn't show you the, the full results. Because, you know, with, with this kind of model, with this uncertainties in parameters and in natural conditions, so fitting model is difficult. So it's easy to say my, my model uh, is a good model because my predictions are um, uh, consistent with, uh, uh, with, with what is observed because of the error bars. But, well, this is, if your error bars are very, very, very large and anything is consistent. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we 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 we're still working on that. On, on uh, it's not our models, and it's, I mean all, all models are more like that, more or less like that. Okay, and uh, so we we don't have the results at at this point. Uh, and then you have to ask yourself uh, for which locality are you doing the model? Because uh, we are now working for the municipality of São Paulo. So the, the, the first results of the model are, are, are pretty okay. But let's see, because I mean, we can fit the model to what is known now, but let's see what the predictions will be confirmed or not. So we need some months, some months or two to, to know if the predictions will be confirmed and so on. And, uh, and this is for the specific case of the municipality of Sao Paulo, why? Why, why, why not apply this to anywhere? Because if you apply it only to the confirmed case, uh, which is the public data, which you have for anywhere, any city in Brazil or any state in Brazil, this will give you nothing because the confirmed cases are not the representative of the number of actual cases. So you need the now casting procedure in order to initialize your model. So, and we only have this for some city some problem. Okay, thanks. I can see another question from the audience, this time from Omar Suarez. He's asking how are environment, environmental variables included in the simulation of these models? So they are not included explicitly, uh, but you know when you do the fitting, uh, there are variables like the transmissibility of the of the disease. So the transmissibility could depend on the environment. Okay, uh, and so, uh, but transmissibility is fitted because you you don't have the absolute value of that. So you are fitting the environmental variables in this case. Okay? Now, for the model that uh, I showed from the Harvard School, uh, from the Harvard Medical School, uh, the last model, okay? they assume seasonality, which is an environmental variable. Okay? But I mean, that, that's uh, like, like a scenario, like uh, let's say it's seasonal. Nobody knows because we didn't have even one season. Okay, So you, you cannot know. Uh, with, uh, with certainty, you can try to infer from other diseases, like there are all other kinds of coronaviruses, uh, they're called beta coronaviruses, which circulated and uh, around and so on, which have some seasonality, but not very strong. So, but this, this coronavirus, will it be seasonal or not? No way to know. No way to know, because you don't have any, not even one season, you have three, uh, three months. For three months, that, that's it. So you don't know the, the effect of the environment. Yeah, okay. Maybe last question. I have a question for, for Roberto. Sure. So, first of all, very nice to talk. It's very explaining how, how to model and every, all the, the difficulties that has, in fact, to try to make an, any, any prediction in, the, in this case. But I was wondering, in the because this is a stuff that most of the government are 
uh, uses like an excuse to why not to make a full lockdown because it seems that if everybody make a lockdown the the all this uh, epidemic should pass quite fast let's say just just like uh, naively speaking but most of the the government they all the time they use the excuse that is the because of the economical impact is it a, a, a way or is it a way to to try to include in the model this economic impact of to have these people out of oh, the i mean to weird. reduce the activity because government they just based on no it's the economic so all the people has to go outside and we don't care that they get infected because the economy has to continue and this is the, the the kind of the version of many for in the uk was like this moment until the prime minister got infected kind of they were pushing to to here in Chile, sometimes there is a mixed opinion for the government to make it like with a like a blind test to to make politics uh, politics to to try to 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 have the so, best yeah. impact in one case. There, there, there are attempts to include economical uh, variables into epidemiological uh, uh, models. It's non-trivial, and uh, we have been discussing this with this consortium, this uh, COMO uh, consortium from Oxford, and it's, uh, and it's uh, more variables and more unknown parameters. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, this is so it's thing. difficult to know, but uh, it, what for sure, it, if you are at the if you are at the start of an exponential growth, if you don't do anything. Yeah, uh, you you get a million of people dead in Brazil in in, in some uh, some some weeks. So so the, whatever the economic part is, you have to. I mean, you have to take action. Now, a serious um, debate, which is not obviously the case of Brazil, because it is the, you know situation. But, uh, 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 but serious debate, for instance, in Europe, like in Germany, or uh, uh, when I follow more or less the German uh, situation, uh, is about obviously how do we get out of this thing? Okay, so uh, the population will still be susceptible because we are in home, we didn't have infection. I'm still susceptible, and I would just lose out the all. I mean, just lose the the the. the the interventions, I go home, I go on the streets and so on. The virus will say, okay, nice, new, new people for me. Okay, so we'll be a mess and uh, we'll be just really bad, okay? So how, how should we go out of the thing? So, uh, well, the favorite policies that I've, uh, I've been discussing is like uh, the Korean way. The Korean way is, well, uh, you you just test people, okay? but I mean this means intensive testing, lots of tests, putting up a system of testing people, uh, which is a kind of of, of uh, a very very intensive thing, and uh, then you have and then also issuing uh, uh, immunity uh, 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 cards. Like I mean, if you have had the uh, you have been tested. You will have a mark on your on, on your on a card and saying, uh, "Okay, tested negative, positive. Uh, you are immune, and so on." Which would then decide what what uh, what kind of activities you would be allowed to do, and so on. But it's you know, so this is this is a very complicated thing. It's not an easy thing to do to 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 put up. And uh, in countries like Brazil, this is it seems it seems crazy because you know. Uh, uh, for the time being in Brazil, if you want, that, that we we are in a in a soft lockdown, and in, in this in, like in São Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and the other cities, it's a mm -hmm. soft thing because you are not you are not you can go out, you can do whatever you want actually, okay? But the, the commerce is closed, so maybe you don't go out because you have nothing to do out, outside. But you can go out, so. Now, uh, uh, in, in such a situation, uh, uh, there has been no attempt to build a, a way of getting out of this situation. So we are stuck with this situation. Okay? We are stuck, and economically, this is obviously very, very, very difficult situation. 
but you have to build a way of getting out of it without having a super epi epidemic. Because if you just say it now, okay, it's over. You go out, you have an epidemic, you have again a million of, the, of people there. So mm -hmm. that, that's the situation. Yeah, it's complicated. Okay. No, it's very complicated, very complicated. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry. I, no, sorry, please go ahead. And... Okay, one more question, because since in my case, I live in a small city from, with respect with the capital of Chile, that is where most of the cases are, but we, we do have cases here locally. So mm -hmm. how did this, this modelization in terms of the, for instance, when you were presenting the different models, SIR model and so on, should be also made local in each city, I guess, no? Not because sometimes yeah. it's like kind of they take the whole country, like all the population is mixed all together, kind of, but. So, yes, uh, actually uh, collaboration, but uh, some of those people that were on my list on the, on the, at the end, are doing network theory and uh, not with the airplanes, but with uh, roads uh, to, to uh, assess uh, to, uh, uh, vulnerability of cities. Because maybe you are a small city, which is not connected to anything, then you are not very vulnerable. But if you are connected to a lot of things, you are more vulnerable. So using uh, network uh, theory, network metrics, can be a way to uh, access uh, um, vulnerability. But then there's a second layer of analysis, which is how many uh, hospital beds you have. So uh, that maybe you are in a place that it's likely to be, uh, um, to take some time for have the epidemic. But maybe you don't have beds. So then there's the second layer of vulnerability that says, okay, you're in a bad situation. Okay. So there are these two things. And one thing is this is the spread, the distribution of the spatial distribution through the roads and through movement of people in a certain region. So we have made this kind of uh, analysis for the state of Sao Paulo and for the northeastern part of Brazil. And uh, so you, you see the hubs and so on, and where are the next cities that you expect to have the epidemic and so on. You can get, you can get alerts and all of that, you can do this. And then you have the second layer of, okay, uh, next city will be, I don't know, certain city, but okay, this city has a lot of beds. So you don't expect to have an overwhelming problem there. But could be also the contrary. Uh, for instance, in, in the Sao Paulo state, we have uh, discovered that there are some very, the cities are very far apart from the capital, and uh, which have no cases at all uh, at this moment of time. But uh, well, uh, if nobody does anything, or if there, there should be cases because well, some unless you just shut down the, I mean, the, completely the transportation system. Uh, at a certain point, there will be a case, and the case will be transmitted because it's highly infected. And then, then you look at these places and you say, okay, but these places can be a problem because even if it will take time to get the epidemic there, it will have a very bad, a very high, very strong uh, uh, consequences because there are no no hospitals. Can't yeah, you right? Okay, thanks. Let, let me take a very last question. This one comes from Mario Acero. He's asking about vaccination and whether there are treated as immunity in the model. I didn't understand uh, whether there are. Treated as immunity in the, as people that got immune to the virus in the model. So in, in, in the model we are working for Brazil, immunity is life, uh, lifelong, but uh, obviously the, the, the model is meant to model the next months. Okay? So if you want to go for a long time thing, you have to have something like the Harvard model. Then you can say, okay, I don't know the immunity. Right? So it is completely open. The natural immunity of people, how long will it last? They say, okay, then I have vaccine. Okay, if I have a vaccine like the ones that we have for 
the, 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 the child disease and, and so on, then you're okay, then you're immune, and, and that's fine, that's problem solved. But maybe you have a vaccine with a certain percentage of effectiveness. And maybe the immunity conferred by the vaccine is not lifelong. So if you look, if, if you talk about, for instance, vaccines today of our measles, okay, you, you, you know, you have to, to, to go to vaccination to, for, for your, your kids and then, then they don't have the, the disease, never in their life. It's, it's, it's fabulous. But this is also, a result of many years of research from going from something which is has an effectivity of say 60%, 70% and gives you uh, immunity over five years to something which actually has a very good coverage and lifelong immunity. So this is research to be done. It's kind of not the kind of research that we do because this is research in microbiology and in biology. And uh, but this is likely to take time, yeah. And and it's not that there will not be a vaccine. Say maybe there's a vaccine next year. But what kind of vaccine? Real vaccine? Lifelong immunity? How long will the immunity build? So you will have to have tests. And 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 you know, uh, in order to access, just just to make an assessment of how long is the immunity conferred by a vaccine you have to follow a cohort of people over a lot of years. And, and while you are doing this, you are completely in the black, you don't know, unknown. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way it is. And it's not only for COVID, okay. obviously. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Roberto, no, for, for nice yeah, talk. You're welcome, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Okay. And so, so one more thing. So next week we will not have a webinar, but in two weeks' time we'll have a Luca Vitinelli talking maybe about uh, action physics. I think so. We're we're back to 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 higher energy physics. But okay. Thank so you very much, Roberto. Okay, we can call it a day. Thank you for the. I mean, for the. For the thank, thank you, for all the audience and uh, and for the invitation. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. Goodbye. Ciao. See you guys. Ciao. Ciao. Hasta la vista. <laughs>